Okay, today we're going to talk about classical sculpture. So we began the unit on classical art and architecture by looking at classical paintings, and we looked at Roman paintings, Roman frescoes, and also Greek vase paintings. So today we're going to look at both at Greek sculpture and at Roman sculpture. Um, and the key terms for this um, subject are statue and relief, which are two different kinds of sculpture, um, three artistic styles that actually are Greek, are the archaic style, the classical style, and the Hellenistic style. The term koros, which refers to an early archaic um, statue. Contraposto, which is actually a, um, st a style of standing that classical sculptures began to use. Um, the term heroic nude. I put that in quotes because this is kind of the, the use of nudity to portray um, heroes and gods, um, and it's not really realistic, so we call it kind of the heroic style. Um, and then the term polychromy, which refers to the painting of classical statues, which is a new discovery that scientists have made in the 20th century. Um, and it's very interesting to think about that many marble statues from the ancient world were actually painted. And finally, we'll look at an actual sculpture, um, the Augustus statue of Prima Porta. So that's a Roman sculpture. So we'll begin by looking at Greece, and then we'll look over at um, some Roman examples of sculpture. Um, now, when I said classical sculpture um, before, I was talking about two different styles. We have statues, probably this is what we think of when we think of classical sculpture. A uh, statue is sort of a freestanding sculpture. You can walk around it in 360 degrees and it is carved in the round. And then we have something called relief sculptures. And these are, oh sorry, sorry, these are scenes that are actually still attached to the background. So in this particular example of a relief sculpture, the scene is very shallow. It's carved in a very shallow way. And we would call this a low relief um, sculpture. And here on this sarcophagus, the scene is almost detached from the background. And in this instance, we would call it a high relief. So there's a variation in the um, kind of depth of which the, the relief is carved. But the difference in the experience of viewing something like that, a relief sculpture, is that you don't necessarily walk around the figures, but you actually move across the, the scene. So you kind of walk with the, um, the, the, you know, the image, excuse me, the, the scene that's being portrayed. So this will often be on, you know, um, architectural um, panels on walls or something that you move across a relief sculpture. So you'll find them in different ways. Okay, so there are three, let's start with Greek sculpture. There are three um, styles for Greek sculpture. The first is the archaic style, which you can see an example here on your left. And this is the oldest style, and it takes its name from the period of history that is uh, that we call archaic, which really does mean the oldest, <laughs> the oldest period. Um, then the second um, style of Greek sculpture is the classical style, and that's around the fifth century BC. And then finally, we have the Hellenistic style, which was the style that was popular during that period of um, kind of post Macedonian conquest after Alexander the Great conquered the Greek world. There was a very popular, very realistic style of sculpture that. Um, was kind of being used. So you might notice by laying these three styles here together, there's an increase in realism over time and of movement. So that's something to, that we'll see in a minute. Let's start with the oldest style. This is the archaic style, which was common in the 7th and 6th centuries BC. Um, and you may notice that this style is very characterized by symmetry, that there are, you know, kind of elements on the left that are repeated on the right. The hair is very symmetrical here, um, but also on this kind of frozen stance, um, a rigidity of um, position. And it really takes a lot of influence from Egyptian art. Um, picture the sculptures that you've seen outside of Egyptian pyramids or in Egyptian tombs, and they are almost always, um, you know, kind of with the same, um, you know, stiff formal frontal position. Um, now we have not very many examples of different types of sculpture from this early period, but we do have a number of these youths, um, which are known as kouros in Greek, which is the word for youth. And these are the freestanding Greek statues that are depicting young men. Um, there's also a number of uh, statues that depict young women, and we call these the kori, which means maiden in Greek. And the kori are also um, 
you know, kind of frontal, but they are clothed. <laughs> the male statues are unclothed. That is actually something that's different about these early statues um, from Egyptian art. Egyptian art tends to clothe male figures. The Greeks tended not to clothe them. The nude male was something that they were interested in uh, from the very earliest period. And the focus was on kind of this ideal um, kind of muscular body that um, would show that the person who died, because these are often on like burial sites, um, was someone who had achieved this kind of perfection of manhood. Um, and then there's also this, what they call the archaic smile. So if you notice that there's a slight smile, a slight upturned lip um, on both of these figures, that's common in archaic uh, sculptures. And scholars don't know why these sculptures were all s smiling, um, but it is something that was, you'll see even on, pic on um, sculptures of wounded warriors who are dying <laughs> um, will have a kind of an eerie smile on them. Um, so this is the earliest phase of Greek sculpture, the archaic style. The next phase is what we call the classical style. And this is, um, you know, the style that was common during Athens' great glorious fifth century. And you may notice right away that the focus is not so much on this rigidity and um, formal expression, but on movement and on harmony and balance. And the um, there were manuals published at the time that talked about how mathematical proportion should be used in sculpting um, the human body. Um, and the focus here is on balancing kind of direction, so uh, a raised arm versus a lowered arm, um, and also um, between tension and relaxation. So this is uh, an athlete, a discus thrower, and if you notice he's got one leg that's kind of tense and then the other leg is relaxed. And he's got one arm that's engaged and another arm that's free. And this is considered to be kind of a balance in the sculpture. Um, and all of these sculptures being produced in this classical style would have been nudes, um, and, the and the nudity was being used to represent um, gods or heroes or even athletes who would I would put into that category because these are people who um, were competing at Olympic Games. They were competing at these kind of, you know, games that all Greek people were invited to. And the athletes who won at the games, their names would be known, they would be celebrated, and sculptures would be made in their honor. Um, and so we do have many sculptures uh, that <laughs> survive of athletes. And so they, they become a focus of um, sculpture during this period reflecting that increased interest in sport um, among the Greeks. And actually, Athens had their own set of games, which they called the Pan-Athenaic Games, um, in which all of Attica, if you remember Attica's Athens hinterland, all of Attica would come and compete in various different sports. Um, and so you could, you know, um, enjoy the perfection of the human form, but also watch them in this contest among, and watch them kind of battle it out um, in a contest. So... Um, one other thing I'll say about classical, this classical period is that the new style of standing that I mentioned before, the contrapposto style develops, and this is considered to be a breakthrough in Western art. And what it is, is basically kind of when a person, instead of standing in a full frontal position with rigid legs, um, like the Cori and the Koros, um, here the weight is rested on one leg. So um, the, um, the weight is rested on this one leg, and then the other leg is left free. And what this does is it creates kind of a, a softer, more relaxed stance and a slight S-curve to the body. And it also, it makes for a more dynamic position. So even, it's almost like when your leg is engaged on the left, your right shoulder actually goes down. And when your leg is free on the right, then your right shoulder goes up. So there's a kind of um, balance between your shoulders and your legs in the human body. So it makes for, um, yeah, a more dynamic viewing experience. Um, and notice too that these sculptures are actually made out of bronze. Bronze is a material that can handle this kind of um, new, um, new position in art. It has greater tensile strength. It can take a lot more stress. So, um, you know, for example, here's a point of stress on the sculpture, um, this arm that's being um, extended in the air. Stone would be very weak at this point. Um, and it would easily break off. Whereas bronze, because it's metal, it's a metal, it's an alloy of copper and tin, um, can actually bear this weight. So you can see a lot of these bronze sculptures, 
even though many of them don't survive, but the ones that do, um, are able to achieve this kind of contrapposto stance or even more, um, you know, difficult stances where you'll see javelin throwers or, um, you know, the discus thrower, and they are extending their arms in a way that stone wouldn't be able to do un, um, unsupported. Okay, so the contrapposto um, stance. That's actually an Italian word, by the way, and that means kind of counterpoise. Okay, and then in the fourth century, we do have a female nude um, appearing in sculpture. And this is supposedly the first one was Praxiteles Aphrodite. Up to this point, portraying women um, unclothed was very immodest, and it would have been seen as scandalous. But then Praxiteles, who was a uh, sculptor, came up with the idea of portraying goddesses in the nude uh, to get around the problem of immodesty. And the first goddess he chose to sculpt was Aphrodite. And she's the goddess of love. So she seemed to be a good candidate for kind of a sensual sculpture that would reveal the female form, which if you notice is not so much the focus is on musculature, but kind of on the softness and on that balance and harmony. So she's also in this scene standing contraposto. Um, and her arms are kind of one is raised, one is lowered. Um, and so they're still applying those principles of Greek sculptural technique to the female body, but emphasizing um, in not so much muscle, but kind of the softness and the, the beauty of the female form. Um, and then finally, um, right around the same time, we see this movement towards uh, increased realism in Greek art. And we call this the Hellenistic style, um, taking its name from that period of you know, Macedonian rulership. And the emphasis here is on emotion, um, realism and emotion. So this is a very famous Hellenistic statue called the Nike of Samothrace. Um, and Nike is actually the goddess of victory. And here Nike would have been, maybe if, you sh if she had her head and her arms left, she would be shouting out, uh, you know, victory. Um, and this was a commemorative statue of a naval battle. And but but the thing here, I mean, is she's the way that the fabric is being used to kind of show the wind that is kind of pushing against her. It's meant to show you this kind of force outside of Nike that you experience um, kind of through the movement of the fabric. So it is a an appeal to pathos. Um, the other thing that you'll see in Hellenistic of sculpture, excuse me, is that other subjects besides heroes and, and um, gods are depicted. And so common, we, oh, common people and, and women, old women, young women, children, um, and even animals become the subject of um, sculpture. So it's kind of pushing the boundaries of Greek um, sculpture in the Hellenistic period. Um, now, I mentioned that we are learning more and more that many of these marble statues were actually painted, and that technique of painting scu uh, sculptures is something called polychromy, meaning many colors. It comes from the Greek prefix many, and the word for color, chromos. And the it was one of the reasons they people didn't know about it for so long is that much of the paint that was used on these sculptures actually had been wiped away over time. Um, so the statues looked white when they came out of the ground. But with technology, scholars were able to see that there actually is a kind of trace of the original paint left on many sculptures. Um, so here you can see there's like a pattern of some kind of design on the helmet that um, this particular statue has. And then they've been working more and more to um, kind of reanalyze and works that are already in the museum. It's as though they have to go study what's the, what they already have to see if there are traces of um, ancient paint. So I have a video for you from the British Museum of, of scholars now studying the um, relief sculptures that were on the Parthenon. Ever since the Parthenon sculptures first went on show in the British Museum at the beginning of 1817, there's been this fascination, this quest to discover its ancient colour. But it's kept its secret for nearly 200 years now. The travellers who, in the Enlightenment, went to Athens were able to see more even than we see today of the evidence for painting the architecture. And naturally, they speculated that the sculpture that was framed by the architecture was painted too. But from that time until now, there hasn't been 
a single strap of evidence to prove that the sculptures from the Parthenon in the British Museum were coloured. Of course, what archaeologists want to do is to make discoveries and in the British Museum, so deep are the collections that there are always the possibility for those eureka moments. I was doing regular imaging and I was using a particular kind of light. There was something which was glowing, which was beyond the levels I was expecting for that specific case. And so I realized that that was luminescence from Egyptian blue, so it was possible to use those lights to excite this glow-in-the-dark effect. Egyptian blue was widely used across the Mediterranean. So the Greeks used it, the Romans used it, and the Egyptians obviously used it. It's a pigment which has a very special property. It absorbs visible radiation and it re-emits infrared radiation. And the images will show Egyptian blue as glowing white. On this head, there are traces of polychromy, or paint, on the cheek and the sides of the eyes. We cannot see all the pigments which were originally present on this sculpture with the naked eye, but we could use this methodology, which is capable of identifying Egyptian blue, even if it's present only in very minute traces. The same technique which we used on this unidentified head from the Temple of Artemis in Ephesus was used to reveal the presence of Egyptian blue on the Parthenon sculptures. I think there is a collective conspiracy in each generation to forget that ancient sculpture was painted. We forget it because the Renaissance forgot it when they found sculpture in excavations in Rome where paint had faded and contemporary sculptors chose to carve marble without paint. Ours is a culture that still shares the arts and crafts movement aesthetic of truth to materials. We can't bear the thought that one takes marble and polishes it to a sheen and then obscures its white pure surface with coloured paint. But that is what was done in antiquity. In the pediments we find colour on the backs of some of the sculptures, which is curious considering that they would never have been seen once they were placed in position on the bottom shelf of the pediment. But then it's also curious that the sculptures were carved on the backs when they wouldn't be seen. A not impossible explanation is that the sculptures like the building, were a great votive offering to deity. And by representing the gods and the worshippers, there was an act of religious communion with them. So one could say that out of reverence for the gods, colour was added to the finish, where perhaps it wasn't to be seen. There is a reference in Plutarch to Pericles taking visitors while the great works were being undertaken and showing them the carvers in the workshops. And I think we can imagine a privileged viewing of the sculptures before they went up onto the building, never to be seen at such close quarters again, until Lord Elgin removed them and turned them back into a privileged viewpoint. Iris, the goddess of the rainbow and of the upper air, is touching down from flight. Her tunic presses itself flat against her belly and her breasts and flutters out at the edge and is contained by a belt above the waist. A belt which now, only now, we understand is blue. I confess that after long years of looking and not finding, I've begun to doubt that the sculptures were painted at all. Then suddenly, there is the belt of iris glowing away, full of Egyptian blue, and everything changes.
Okay, so I think what that video highlights is, um, you know, one of his, the answers to this question about why we didn't know about polychrome and the fact that most of these stone statues from the ancient world were painted. I distinguish that between uh, the I distinguish that from the bronze statues. Um, bronze is such a precious metal, and when ancient sculptures were sculptors were using bronze, they would reveal the beauty of the um, of the metal. It actually would have been much more burnished and and more like a gold color in the ancient world, not so much like that corroded version of the um, warriors that you saw earlier. Um, but most stone statues would have been painted, um, and one reason that we didn't know about it is that the um, paint had worn. A, paint has worn away. But another reason is that there was kind of a prejudice that the Renaissance artists had against painted statues. They associated painted statues with the medieval church. So here's an example of a German um, kind of relief sculpture uh, from the Middle Ages. And you know, the Italian Renaissance artists thought that this was kind of childish. They didn't see it as intellectual. They saw it as an appeal to the people and that the ancients had it right by only, you know, using this refined stone um, and keeping it pure from color. And so when Renaissance artists <laughs> began sculpting their own works, they would not, um, they would actually use it in, um, they would, they would keep it white and pure in the pure marble stone. So this is actually Michelangelo, sorry, Michelangelo's David, <laughs> done in the 15th century. Um, so their prejudice against painted statues, we inherited today. And, um, you know, it's still, most people don't realize that ancient statues were actually painted in, in bright and vivid colors and not really to our modern aesthetic. Um, okay. So let's talk a little bit about Roman sculpture. The same rules apply. Um, you know, most of the bronze sculptures uh, would have been left kind of unpainted, but the stone statues, even in Rome, would have been painted. Um, but Roman sculpture was heavily influenced by Greece. When Rome conquers Greece in the third century BC, they brought sculptures and poets and teachers and, you know, every uh, kind of cultural achievement of the Greeks they imported into their own um, into their own country, into their own uh, the center of the empire, and they adopted those. Um, artistic practices in particular. The, the Roman poet Horace famously said, captive Greece took captive her savage conqueror, so that, you know, the Romans basically were just totally enthralled by Greek art and culture. And this is very true for sculpture. So these, <laughs> this is actually uh, sculptures that were found in the villa of the Papyri near Pompeii, which is actually covered by the um, Mount Vesuvius eruption. And they are twin, and I think they, there's some debate as to whether these are runners or whether they're wrestlers, um, but these would be bronze sculptures that would have been put in the garden of this villa, and they are copies of Greek originals. So, And notice the way that even though these wouldn't have been painted, there are, they were using um, stone to um, enhance certain features. So here you have uh, ivory actually for the white part of the eyes and then stone in the darker parts of the eyes. And again, these would have been burnished to like that gold uh, sheen. So as I say, Roman sculpture is very much based on Greek sculpture. They tended to um, make copies of bronze originals. And so one of the ways that we know about Greek bronze sculptures is that the Romans made copies of them. Unfortunately, very few bronze sculptures survived from Greece. You know, there were thousands and thousands and thousands of Greek bronzes, but today probably only around 30 survive. So I think, um, you know, one student in our class, I think maybe Jonathan, is going to show us one of the Greek bronzes, but I mean, be aware that that's one out of 30 surviving from the ancient Greek world. Many of the bronze sculptures were actually melted down because of the preciousness of bronze. And so that metal was reused for other purposes, possibly even for making weapons. Um, and then those sculptures were recreated in stone. Now, one thing I mentioned before is that bronze has much more tensile strength than stone. So what happens when you need to put that um, bronze statue into stone? You need to give it some supports. So you will probably notice uh, when you go to museums uh, all across Europe that these Roman copies of Greek originals will have these little connecting pieces that are meant to help support the stone um, and keep it from breaking and snapping off. So this is a, an athlete um, 
kind of putting on, I guess, maybe his headcloth or something. And he is being assisted by these little connecting um, supports. So even actually this little trunk is supporting the leg. It's made into a decorative piece, but it's actually supporting the leg of this statue. Um, okay, so Roman uh, sculpture tends to follow Greek patterns, but there is something distinctive that the Romans contributed, which is the fact that they adopted a much more realistic um, attitude towards portraiture. And so this example here on the left is actually a Roman portrait, whereas this one on the right is a Greek idealistic portrait of an athlete. And the, you know, the focus here was not on showing someone as being, you know, wrinkled, but really on uh, emphasizing the the person's life and the Republican value of service to the state and uh, a military career. It was a distinguished um, achievement to have, you know, wrinkles that you earned on the field of battle. So Roman portraiture tends to be much more realistic, much more individual, individualistic to the, per, um, to the, to the person. Um, and it's very interesting. Honestly, those uh, Roman faces um, are fascinating to look at because they feel so real. They feel like people that you can meet um, versus this idealistic, um, idealistic Greek you know, gods. They, these don't really feel like real people, even though they're very beautiful. Um, so that's something to look for in Roman sculpture. And then I'm going to conclude today by talking about one of the key uses of Roman um, sculpture, which is as a propaganda um, instrument. So this is a very famous statue. This is the Augustus, a statue of Augustus found near Prima Porta in Italy. And this was produced for um, right after Augustus died. This is a sculpture of him. And this is an example of how the sculpture were, sculptures and portraits of the emperor, emperors were used as kind of ways to communicate the, um, you know, the, the, the divine birth or the descent and the political achievements of these rulers. So in this statue, there's a lot of symbolism going on. Um, and, you know, Augustus is standing here. He's not nude. He's not the heroic nude. He's actually wearing his military, um, you know, a military costume. And it's emphasizing his role as a military commander. On his breastplate, there are actually scenes of him. There's the god Mars, who's the god of war, and then there are scenes um, in uh, various personifications of parts of the Roman world that he brought into the empire or that he controlled through his battles. Um, so you have different provinces being personified on his breastplate. He is barefooted in this statue, and that is to show that he is divine. He is actually a god himself. He was deified in 14 AD. Um, you know, not only is he the son of Julius Caesar, but Augustus himself was deified. Um, over here, this little support that's used to prop up this marble statue is a dolphin that uh, is being um, kind of um, ridden by... Era, um, the Cupid, who is a god that is associated with the goddess Venus. And Cupid, or Eros is um, another name for him, is um, a kind of a reference to the fact that Augustus is adopted by the Julius family. And the Julius family dates their, um, or um, claims descent from the goddess Venus. So he's portraying himself as being descended from the goddess Venus. And then the dolphin refers to the Battle of Actium, in which he defeated Antony and Cleopatra. So there are all sorts of layers to this sculpture. Um, and this kind of thing would have been put out across the empire. You would have sculptures of the emperor in various towns and in public spaces and um, this would have been painted as well. <laughs> and so it would be as though Augustus himself has come in the flesh and you encounter him every day in the public square. And it's a way of communicating your power and your right to rule to the Roman people.